Oh, go, go this one? Great. Well, okay. Well, we, we've just solved the difficulty by avoiding it. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Jude Blanchett. I'm the Freeman Chair in China Studies here at CSIS. Uh, it's great to see everyone here uh, on a cold, wet Monday. Um, I think this is uh, the interest in this is both a, a reflection of the importance of the subject, but, but also I we've got a really great group of individuals here uh, to, to discuss this issue. Uh, one I think we'll be discussing uh, for a long time, and this is uh, the beginning of the conversation on, on this question of U.S.-China relations, but as, as it pertains to the ideolo ideological realm rather than the end of it. Um, obviously, there's a growing consensus here in Washington, D.C., that, that U.S. and China are locked in a longer-term geopolitical uh, competition, but on the realm of ideas and ideology, I think there's been uh, uh, some dispute and some ongoing discussion. You've got some folks who are arguing that China's posture is primarily defensive in nature, uh, folks who think that this is essentially about China making the world safe for autocracy. Uh, others are arguing that this is a more offensive strategy uh, by the CCP under Xi Jinping and one based on core ideological constructions that um, uh, compel China to be uh, uh, looking to compete and combat with the United States across a wide uh, range of issues. So we're going to dive into that today. We've, uh, we've got a lot to get through, so I'm going to get right into it. Um, to help us navigate the discussion, uh, we've got four individuals, I think, uniquely placed and coming from a wide set of backgrounds here. To my immediate left is Jessica Chen Weiss who's an associate professor of government at Cornell and the author of an absolutely excellent book called Powerful Patriots, Nationalist Protest in China's Foreign Relations. Uh, to her left is Dan Tobin, who's a member of the China Studies faculty at National Intelligence University out in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, prior to this, Dan was a China specialist at the DOD uh, and a senior analyst at US Indo-Pacific Command's China Strategic Focus Group. To Dan's left is uh, Toshi Yoshihara, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, uh, and as uh, evidenced by his, his equally fantastic book, Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge to U.S. Maritime Strategy, one of the world's foremost experts in China's military and military strategy. And finally, on the very far left is uh, Andy Murtha, who's the George and Sadie Hyman Professor of China Studies at Johns Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And we're delighted that uh, Andy's uh, office, you can literally see if you look out the back window. So uh, we've got him close by, and that makes it more difficult for him to, to say no uh, to these uh, invitations. Uh, before we get started, just a few quick uh, admin and logistics notes. Uh, first is, if we have any sort of security incident, um, I will uh, help lead you out these exits. We'll go down into the alley, and then we'll, uh, we'll meet up at the National Geographic building, which is just south on 17th Street. Uh, we're going to run 90 minutes today. We're, we're going to end very promptly, so actually we're going to run not quite 90 minutes, but 84 minutes. Uh, what we'll do is each of the four speakers will come up here and speak for about 10 minutes, and then we'll open it up to uh, Q&A. I will probably take uh, moderator's prerogative and ask the first question or so. And then final, anyone who's interested in this topic, I just want to give a quick plug to an event we're doing on uh, November 4th, which is called China's New Era in Techno Governance. One of the themes I suspect will come up today is about China uh, exporting or utilizing some elements of, of technology that it's developing there to other authoritarian states, facial recognition, AI. This has become a key component of this, this uh, topic of ideological competition or, or a systems clash. So we've got uh, three journalists who have been digging into this, uh, Josh Chin and Kate O'Keefe at the Wall Street Journal, and then uh, Christina Larson at the Associated Press. Uh, Josh and Christina were, were our, our, our old comrades from our days in China. They've been looking at this uh, on the ground in China, and then Kate has been doing some really fantastic reporting here in D.C. about how China is acquiring some of these technologies. So that's uh, uh, November 4th. And with that, uh, we can begin, and I will turn the podium, or I should say the lavalier mic, over to, to Jessica. So if you want to stand here, I think you're, they'll turn your lavalier on. 
turn this on? Oh, can everybody hear all right? Okay, great. Well, thanks so much, Jude. It's wonderful to be here, and thanks to all of you for coming out on Monday morning. Um, this is, I think, one of the most important uh, questions that we are wrestling with today as we think about U.S.-China competition. How big is the ideological dimension, and how important is it as a driver of U.S.-China competition? So in Foreign Affairs uh, this summer, I wrote a piece called A World Safe for Autocracy? Question mark, China's Rise and the Future of World Politics. And in it, uh, I argue that while many have watched China's authoritarian turn at home and growing influence abroad and concluded that China poses an existential threat, I think that this gets the challenge from Beijing wrong. Not since Mao has China sought to export uh, revolution or topple democracy. China has instead sought to make a world safe for autocracy to coexist with democracy, first and foremost for CCP rule uh, to remain at the helm in China. Of course, uh, to be sure, China has uh, offered alternatives to U.S.-led institutions. It has sought to combat universal values and made it easier for other authoritarian regimes uh, to thrive and survive. And most recently in the NBA controversy made apparent, uh, China's efforts to squelch dissent have uh, spread beyond its borders and are having a corrosive effect on free speech and liberal values abroad. Still, these efforts reflect less a grand strategy bent on undermining democracy and spreading autocracy wholesale around the world and more rooted in a desire to secure CCP rule at home and its material interests abroad. These are real challenges, but in my view, they do not amount to a new Cold War. And in particular, I think that framing competition with China uh, in ideological terms misses the true sources of China's international influence, its economy and its growing technological might. So I wanna go through each of the different issue areas where I see China's influence growing and what that reflects about China's intentions in this ideological realm. First, uh, Xi Jinping has more than previous Chinese leaders been willing to um, proudly point to a China example uh, as a, one that others can emulate. At the same time, he has also uh, cautioned that China will not export this model uh, nor require others to copy China. Whether or not you believe that rhetoric, I think it will be very hard for other countries to replicate China's political and economic system. And my sense is that in promoting a Chinese solution, so to speak, she is really focused on pushing back against the idea that there is uh, universal convergence towards democracy as the end of history, and pushing back against the idea that democracy is necessary for development and modernization. In international institutions, China has also helped shield autocracies from international pressure, but not always. Uh, it has voted, China has voted for sanctions against Libya, for example, and gone along with international resolutions that as long as they do not, in Beijing's view, threaten regime change. Financially, China's uh, international assistance has given governments uh, an attractive alternative to traditional international lenders, uh, undermining conditionality. Still, I think that's important to note it's different from Beijing's aid uh, going to particular types of regimes. Uh, instead, I think others have found that Beijing's aid tends to follow its political and economic interests um, rather than targeting autocracies per se. In the realm of digital authoritarianism, this is indeed an area of great concern. China's export of surveillance and censorship technologies have made it easier for other authoritarian states and would-be authoritarian states to follow China's example in monitoring its civilians. But the diffusion of these technologies is still not the same as an intentional effort uh, to remake other governments in China's image. Finally, in the concern about uh, China's export of censorship. Indeed, China has, uh, under Xi Jinping, been much more aggressive in its efforts to police and intimidate speech beyond China's borders, particularly on issues that the CCP fears could undermine and weaken its grasp at home and are challenging its ability to achieve its objectives vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan and maintain its undisputed control over Hong Kong, Tibet, and Xinjiang. Most recently, we've seen this with the NBA and Blizzard and other uh, foreign corporations being forced to toe the party line or risk losing business in China. 
This is deeply concerning, yet I think it's important to also recognize that the Communist Party's purpose here, again, does not appear to be undermining democracy wholesale, but nonetheless, it's important to recognize that these activities are uh, threatening to democratic values here at home. What I think uh, when we ask you know, what kind of ideological competition exists today between the United States and China, there is clearly an ideological component, and yet I see it more, uh, less as a, a new Cold War and more as an emerging security dilemma in which China, in its efforts to make the world safer for the CCP, appear to be threatening uh, the values uh, of liberal democracies overseas, not by intent, but still uh, as a consequence of its defensive efforts. This means I think we need to work with uh, and negotiate uh, a more shared understanding of what is acceptable efforts to defend CCP rule, or at least ones that we can tolerate, and what is unacceptable interference uh, into the so-called internal affairs of other uh, countries. If China were bent on destroying democracy or spreading authoritarianism wholesale, containment might be appropriate. But a strategy of trying to counter Chinese influence wherever it appears across the globe, I think is misguided and dangerous. Not only is the United States ill-equipped to win in a with us or against us competition with China, but I think it also more um, dangerously threatens the very uh, openness of our society and the liberal principles uh, for which the United States has stood. So we may, and I do, uh, see the retreat of democracy around the globe um, with dismay, but I think critics also exaggerate uh, the role uh, that Beijing has played in this trend. The Chinese Communist Party welcomes evidence of democratic dysfunction, but this does not amount uh, to a grand strategy uh, bent on destroying democracy or uh, exporting autocracy as a form of government around the globe. In confronting the challenge uh, that China poses, I think the best approach is for the United States and other liberal democracies to defend and restore democracy at home, starting right here in the United States and reinvesting in the multilateral institutions and allies that will make a sort of concerted effort uh, to confront and curb China's worst practices um, possible. We need to work with China on issues where uh, their leadership is critical, such as climate change, and on issues where Chinese uh, efforts do not undermine or conflict with democratic principles. And I think it's important that we also criticize China where its actions fall short and work uh, in cooperation with others to curb um, the worst excesses of uh, Chinese communist influence, whether that's exporting censorship uh, or profiting unfairly from trade agreements. Ultimately, I see the Chinese Communist Party engaged in a defensive ideological battle against liberal norms and democratic diffusion. So far, at least, China does not appear to be engaged in an offensive uh, ideological effort to spread autocracy wholesale around the world. And so in the end, I think this gives us space to make democracy work better, to set an example for others to follow, and ultimately for us to invest in the real sources of China's growing influence, which are its economic and technological capabilities. Thanks very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thanks, guys. Jude Blanchett and CSIS for inviting me, um, and it's also an honor to share the stage with such a distinguished panel. I've spent most of my professional career um, inside the government, either in windowless rooms or rooms with the shades drawn, so it's a delight to have the opportunity to engage in the open discussion about how to understand our contest with China. And because my university is part of the Department of Defense, I need to start with the disclaimer that all statements of fact, analysis, or opinion are mine alone and do not reflect the official policy or position of National Intelligence University, the Department of Defense, or any of its components, or the US government. Um, let me begin by saying uh, that I agree with Dr. Weiss, what she's expressed el elsewhere, that it's important to emphasize that we're not in a clash of civilizations with Chinese culture or with the Chinese people. However, I think it's clear that we are in a global systems competition with the Communist Party of China. 
Now, this is a contest with many dimensions, but I think it's imperative to begin by understanding it as an ideological uh, contest and to simply um, play off of one of Dr. Weiss's comments about whether it's the driver of U.S.-China rivalry. I would actually argue that uh, the Thucydides trap that lots of people describe in terms of China's growing power and the fear that it causes in the United States, I don't think is the driver of U.S.-China rivalry. I think the driver is precisely the ideological competition between our two systems as a source of distrust. I think that if India was the rising power, while there might be some in the national security establishment that would want to maintain our privacy, our primacy, uh, many Americans would simply say, let's build some bridges at home. I think it's precisely the ideological dimension that's, that's causing this distrust. Now, um, I'm going to make three points about how paying attention to ideology and specifically to the party's Leninist ideology and its role is crucial to understanding the nature of U.S.-China rivalry. First, I'm going to address um, how the party's mixture of Leninism and nationalism drives its global ambitions. Um, then I'm going to talk about the implications of the party's Leninist view of politics uh, should Beijing succeed in its ambition to become the leading power. And then I have a third point, which I'll say for the question and answer period, try to work it in about how our research agenda in China studies needs to change in order to unpack the party's ideas. So first of all, um, I think we need to be clear that we're not simply in a generalized, um, broad competition with, between autocracy and democracy. We're in a specific uh, competition with the ideology of the, of the Communist Party of China, um, which since the 1980s it is called um, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And it's crucial here to understand that this is a species of Leninism. Now, how we've seen Leninism in China studies and its role in party history in recent decades has been uh, the idea that over the last several decades, the party has traded its faith in Leninism or Leninist socialism um, for some combination of economic legitimacy and a sprinkling of nationalism. I think this is a misreading of both the role of nationalism in Leninism and a misreading of the role of Leninism in the party's history. Though Leninism tells um, a story to um, the victims of colonialism uh, that their um, backwardness owes to a combination of imperialism and exploitation by foreign capital. And it offers a prescription of a um, state led by a single party, a dictatorship led by a single party that has a scientific access to the direction of history and that promises to transform uh, countries from a backward um, look down upon by the rest of the world to a modern country that's actually at the forefront of history owing to that scientific claim about the direction of history. And these are pieces of the intellectual architecture of Leninism that remain uh, animating for the Communist Party of China um, today. Um, for the party, a strong Leninist state has always constituted the only antidote to China's 19th and 20th century weakness. That's the story the party tells. From Mao to Xi, the party has insisted democracy and capitalism were too weak to save China in 1919 when Germany's colonial privileges were given to Imperial Japan at the Paris Peace Conference. Only the party's leadership, Beijing claims, was able to restore China's sovereignty in 1949, prevent China from lapsing back into a victim of imperialism since, and marshal collective effort for development. The mantra is only socialism can save China, only socialism can develop China. And the party's leaders have always insisted, even in their darkest hour as they stood amidst the wreckage of Mao's failed economic policies, that they would ultimately demonstrate the superiority of socialism. For the party, reform has never meant transitioning to another system, but rather perfecting its, its Leninist socialist institutions. Now, under Xi Jinping, what the party says is that China's rise to the number two country in the world vindicates socialism internationally, and it should earn China a place of leadership for having found an alternative route to the Western path to modernity and development. Now, 
this means that the party's ambition is not simply the defensive goal of making the world safe for autocracy. In other words, fostering a world in which its political system is neither threatened nor condemned. Instead, Beijing aims to make China a global leader based on the achievements of its system. National rejuvenation doesn't mean being left alone as one pole in a multipolar world. It means a world in which morality and prestige radiate from Beijing. This is clear from Xi Jinping's speeches, and it, it also flows from the role of Leninism in party history. Now, some scholars, including Dr. Weiss, have noted Xi's public denial of the goal of exporting China's governance model after folks began to pay attention to both the relevant passages in his speech and the accompanying propaganda that has been issued since in Chinese. Um, but that denial by Beijing is not credible, both because of the venue in which she delivered it, which was actually a gathering of world political parties designed precisely to uh, promote China's domestic and international models of governance, but also because the logic of promoting a Chinese model flows directly from the party's consistent ambition of China making a greater contribution to humankind and human development in general on the basis of socialism. So when Xi Jinping talks about turning China by mid-century into a global leader in terms of comprehensive national power and international influence and assuming the center of the world stage, this almost certainly makes making the party's Leninist governance system more prestigious and influential than the West has been. Now, this is not to be accomplished tomorrow. It's a goal for several decades. And it doesn't mean exporting violent revolution, as in the Mao era, or overthrowing Western governments. But it does crucially mean that Beijing is competing to win, not simply to survive. That leads to my second point. If we're to grasp the implications of Beijing's international ambitions, we need to understand how Leninist ideology contrasts with our values. To begin with, it's very clear the party seeks to rewire the international order so that it runs through China. She talks about a protracted struggle over the international order and about opportunities to seize the initiative and set new rules in emerging domains such as cyber, outer space, polar regions, the deep ocean, etc. Beijing claims that Xi's vision of a community with a shared future for humankind will deliver peace and development, sovereignty and security better than Western-centric models that have held sway. Xi also says that Beijing seeks to build a consensus for the transformation of the global governance system on the political basis of a global network of partnerships linked to China rather than US alliances. In this vision, the world's development is inextricable from China's and relies on the party's standards from infrastructure and technology to finance law and domestic security. The key question for us, however, is whether Be the preeminence Beijing envisions would change the nature of the order in a way that is acceptable or unacceptable for the US and its allies. And let me be clear, I agree with Dr. Weiss that we have some important interests in common with Beijing, dealing with climate change being only the most momentous. Yet the phrase ideological competition accurately captures that we have incompatible political visions. That incompatibility, again, has nothing to do with Chinese culture and everything to do with Leninism. In the free world today, we see people as ends in themselves, and belie we believe liberty is worth prioritizing, even if it makes political decisions more difficult and costly, and even if it at times works against the interests of the whole or the group. Leninism, by contrast, makes individuals into means towards the achievement of collective social ends. For Beijing, individual human rights, including freedom of speech, assembly, and religion, are to be trampled on in the name of security and development. The party's conduct in Xinjiang is simply one of the more dramatic contemporary examples of these differences in values. Importantly, however, the metric that a political and social system should be judged by delivering economic growth and not freedom or democracy derives from Lenin in the 1920s. So does Beijing's view that democratic political institutions are simply the tools of specific interests, often class interests, whereas the party's dictatorship is uniquely capable of making scientific policy on behalf of the interests of all the people. Indeed, Beijing's Leninist claim that its policies are scientific is what makes political dissent in China not a normal part of give it, political give and take, but in the party's view, an illegitimate effort to damage the state and threaten its pursuit of the people's collective interests. Does this ideology matter in identifying how a Beijing-centric wor world would function? Well, one answer is that even at China's present level of international power, we have an emerging record of how Beijing reacts when it receives criticism abroad or challenges to its interests, policies, and values. 
That record, I think, is quite familiar to all of those in this audience. There's a torrent of journalism about it every day. And it's a major contributor to darkening strategic perceptions of China in this town and capitals all around the world since the early 2010s. I'll close with that for now. <laughs>
we, as in the Chinese Communist Party, must learn from this failure, end quote. So, in other words, when the party failed to instill adherence to ideological doctrine, people lost faith, lost faith, and it came crashing down. So the lesson is clear. Ideological complacency is lethal to the party's survival. Now, beyond the internal ideological challenges are external ideological threats, particularly from the West. Since the reform and opening era, China's contact with the outside world, including the West, has exploded. That contact uh, has involved the exchange of many ideas, including Western ones, frequently subversive ones. The, the diversification of thought and attitudes within society has in turn accelerated, including the proliferation of potentially politically dangerous ideas. As one study notes, quote, uh, quote, in today's world, war without gun smoke in the ideological domain is everywhere, end quote. Let me repeat that again. In today's world, war without gun smoke in the ideological domain is everywhere. Now, how is this so? Well, let me quote another study. This one's going to be a lengthy quote, but I think it captures, it encapsulates uh, this particular threat perception. Quote, the United States and other Western countries have sought to fulfill their global strategic interests under the banner of democracy, freedom, and human rights. They have increased the political infiltration of some countries, attempting to subvert those regimes while propping up factions that favor Western interests. Hostile international forces have never abandoned the strategic intent of Westernizing and splitting us, us as in China. They are working hard at infiltrating and disrupting us. These infiltration methods have become more varied by the day, while their shapes have become stealthier. They try in vain to overturn the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party and our socialist system, severely influencing our nation's political security, economic security, cultural security, and information security." End quote. I think many American constituents and American audiences uh, might, might find the statement in, in some ways at odds with, uh, with our relationship and with our intent towards China. In any case, this is certainly one perspective. Uh, the United Front Work Department sees the color revolutions in Europe and the Arab Spring as catastrophes in the export and the imposition of Western democratic systems. The United Front Work Department sees the West model also in decline. Its decreased effectiveness and operational failure, according to one study, quote, daily lays bare the disadvantages and limits of Western political systems, end quote. One study concludes that United Front efforts are fundamentally superior to the Western model and better suited to China's historical development and local circumstances. The United Front Work Department sees Western ideas such as universal values and constitutional democracies as ideological contaminants they see people or classes of people potentially carrying and spreading those ideological viruses into the body politic. For example, one study views the people of greater China, such as Hong Kong, Macau, and Taiwan, as those who carry such contaminants. As the study notes, quote, long-term residence in capitalist environments has exposed Hong Kong, Macau, Taiwan, and overseas compatriots to Western values, end quote. The party's influence operations through Chinese overseas students, for example, should be viewed in this context. It is not just that they represent critical intellectual capital for the motherland, but that they could potentially carry those uh, dangerous Western ideas back home. And so there is a need, in essence, to inoculate society back home from these thoughts and ideas. And one way to do so is to manage the problem while it is still out there overseas. I think this conforms to the logic that a good offense is the best defense. So in conclusion, I think the party does see the world in an ideological hue. It sees itself in an ideological contest with the West. The writings bespeak a, bespeak a siege mentality and a paranoia uh, about the outside world. Uh, it is a deeply insecure worldview. But in my mind, even if this is largely a defensive mentality, and we can debate this during the Q&A, uh, to the extent that this is about preserving the party's monopoly on political power, uh, the party has adopted offensive means to achieve its strategically defensive aims. Uh, and I think this conforms to 
uh, Mao's concept of Mao Zedong's concept of active defense, which is again using offensive operational and tactical means to achieve strategically defensive ends. So the challenge for the West is to respond to the party's attempts to essentially convince, if not compel, the external environment to come to terms with and accept the very nature of the authoritarian regime. Now let me conclude with a caveat that of course the United Front Work Department represents only one element of the party apparatus. It represents only a partial picture of the party's perspectives and activities, but I think it is a useful proxy uh, for interpreting the ideological sources of the Sino-US competition and it is a good reminder that ideology still matters. Thank you. So I'd like to uh, thank Jude Blanchett, Alyssa Perez, and CSIS for inviting me here today. And I thank you all of you for being here as well. So for the sake of argument, let me perhaps overstate my case. Are the US and China in an ideological competition? My answer is no. That is not to say that these two countries do not seek to be or do not think they are in ideological competition. They do on both counts, I believe. The reason I think they are unable has to do with how they have both sucked the air out of the room in which a genuine ideological ecosystem can exist, let alone thrive. Neither one today possesses the capacity to pursue anything meaningful on the ide ideological front. Let me start with China. John Garnot's 2017 speech, Engineers of the Soul, is a brilliant treatise on ideology in China today. I cannot do justice to the nuance of his argument in the time that I have allotted today, but let me jot down some important points that he makes that are impossible for me to ignore. First, the dynastic system in China creates a specter of regime collapse as being an inevitable outcome of the wheels of history. Preventing this from happening is a moral imperative for China's leaders. Second, the written word, language, is, quote, an instrument for shaping acceptable behavior and, quote, a weapon for distinguishing enemies from friends. Third, Maoism is based on Stalinism, the core idea being that the problems leaders face is not in achieving power, but in maintaining it. And then finally, Xi Jinping is following this tradition uh, after a pause under Deng Xiaoping, Jiang Zemin, and Hu Jintao. But as compelling as Garnett's argument is, I am not entirely convinced, because what he's talking about is the utilization of ideology, not its substance, its soul, if you will. During Xi Jinping's rise to power, many early analyses likened him to the PRC's founding leader, Mao Zedong. The argument was that Xi was restricting freedoms, reevaluating Maoist social experiments, and enhancing his own power within the system like Mao had before him, and in contravention to much of the thrust of the reform and opening period over the last 40 years. However, such an analysis arguably betrays a misunderstanding of the profound ways in which the two leaders are so different, primarily with regards to ideology. First of all, for Mao, ideology was the spark that would release the innate correctness of action that lay within all of us in pursuit of the goals of socialism. That is, unlike Orthodox Leninism, Mao saw the party and the people as co-equal branches of governance, both bound by ideology, that people are the engines of history and of the importance of releasing the human potential to build the self, the state, the community. In short, realizing all that the human condition has to offer. The people were animated by it while the party directed it, but not too much, at least not in theory. Why not? Because at the end of the day, Mao was extremely distrustful of institutions and bureaucracy. All of Mao's signature accomplishments and failures were attempts to push back against China's governing institutions premised under the notion that the people's ideological orientation, intellectuals during the anti-rightist movement, peasants during the Great Leap Forward, 
and the socialist education movement and disenfranchised young people during the Cultural Revolution. The fact that all of these were failures does not negate the fact that they were genuinely ideological in orientation. Mao believed that people were by default poised towards socialist goals and that incorrect thinking caused us to deviate from them. According to Aminda Smith, thought reform was not about replacing incorrect thinking with something else, but rather by getting rid of it and letting one's default orientation take over, an intellectual state of nature, if you will. That is, one's correct, or I'm sorry, one's incorrect thinking would automatically be replaced by the correct orientation. Xi Jinping's approach could not be more different. While Mao Zedong may have had misplaced confidence in the ideological forces of a given society, Chinese or otherwise, Xi Jinping seems to have precious little confidence in the Chinese society he presides over. More to the point, and this is where the contrast between Mao and Xi could not be greater, Xi's fingerprints on the Chinese body politic are in the form of an unprecedented degree of institution, bureaucratic, state building. For example, through the creation, creation of a vast network of leading groups, as Christopher Johnson and Scott Kennedy and Alice Miller and others have documented, and by increasing the party's micromanagement of traditionally government functions. To Mao, bureaucracy was an anthema. To Xi, it is the savior of his ability to bring China to its full potential. So what does this have to do with ideology? The answer is that if ideology, or the ideology if we can call it that today, whether Chinese socialism with Chinese characteristics or simply the perennial search for wealth and power, is fully and utterly in the service of the state. Propaganda is deployed to create sing a singular platform for Xi as patriarch to deliver on a fortified party state. The negative efforts to curtail access to non-Chinese social media is not ideology, but censorship. That is, the shaping of something, but what exactly? The narrative of the China dream is rudderless and open to infinite interpretation, in contrast, for example, to the Horatio Alger-fueled American dream. And the China model remains unspecified and is one crackdown in Hong Kong away from simply being that of generic, strong-armed authoritarianism. These are slogans, shortcuts, bumper stickers. They are not a robust ideology that can be exported abroad. And the genuine narrative that has emerged under the Xi era, that of China reclaiming its proper place in the global pecking order, is also not an ideology, but a blunt but historically grounded nationalist imperative. And meanwhile, as under Deng, Jiang, and Hu, most Chinese I know, not the ones interviewed by the New York Times or the Washington Post, are able to navigate all of this by simply laying low. This is the opposite of ideological mobilization. But we're not doing much better. If it weren't for the inward turn the United States has taken under the current administration, we would work with these weaknesses on the Chinese side to our advantage. Instead, we have fortified our ability I'm sorry, we have forfeited our ability to effectively compete with China on the ideological front. The traditional ideological strength of the United States is premised on a series of founding principles captured in a set of aspirational documents that are universal in orientation and travel remarkably well over time and space. I would argue that it is these principles, broadly stated, liberty, equality, even the pursuit of happiness, that while in tension with one another, nonetheless animate the work in progress that the United States has always been and will always be. In a stunning New York Times op-ed last week, Admiral William McRaven wrote that we are the most powerful nation in the world because we try to be the good guys. It is the effort that makes all the difference because we try to be the good guys. It is humbling in the eyes of the world when the United States falls short of its principles and responds by picking itself up and trying to do better, that these principles shine the brightest as an ideological lodestone. Yet there is power in observing our founding principles in the breach, as long as such a breach does not reach a critical mass, an international tipping point, which it hasn't really in almost 250 years. That is until now. 
there's a huge difference between falling short, even consistently so, while genuinely pursuing our ideals on the one hand and deliberately jettisoning them on the other. So let me close my prepared comments by saying neither of our two sides are particularly well suited to pursuing an ideologically based competitive framework, at least not right now. The best that either side can hope for on the ideological front is to lose less than the other rather than to win outright. As a result, in the present moment, both sides are perhaps better off competing on another set of fronts than an ideological one. Let me stop here. Thank you. Who, just looking at the time, um, and I want to get to Q and A. And I saw a, a lot of scribbling on notepads. So what I may do is just go down the line and see if, if folks want to. If there's anything that was said uh, that they want to respond to, clarify, debate with. This wasn't set up as a debate, um, and uh, but it somehow fell on a 50-50 a for and against, which I think makes this, uh, which made this such an illuminating discussion. Um, so without putting anyone on the spot, who didn't talk about this, I don't know, Jess, if there was anything that you wanted to uh, address, amplify, criticize, comment on. Mm. If not, I see Dan is chomping at the bit. So <laughs> I'm always I can, chomping at the bit. I, I, can, I can go to Dan and buy you some time if that works. Dan? Sure. Um, I guess uh, I got a, a few quick comments. So I wanted to respond uh, to Jessica's or Dr. Weiss's um, discussion of um, what China's doing today. And I, I appreciate the nuanced and careful discussion that she offers in her book chapter on that. Um, my response to that is that it's early, and this is a 30-year um, aim for the party. So I think we need to take Beijing's aim seriously. I think the aim is very clear if you look at the documents, and that if we were to look at their modernization goals in the 1980s, <coughs> Xi Jinping talks about being on plan in terms of their long-term goals from an agenda laid out in 1987, which was itself a revision to Mao era plans, um, we should take seriously their pursuit of these long-term goals. And that's even more dramatic in the military realm. If you read Jiang Zemin's speeches from 1993 about their military modernization aims, you wouldn't want to assess their, project, their pro, um, progress in 1995, but if you look at their progress today, it's quite, quite dramatic. Um, on the issue of um, whether the, uh, uh, some more about um, defensive versus uh, offensive, uh, I'm, I'm a, a great fan of John Garneau's work and I have great respect for him, but I actually agree with um, the articulation of one of the flaws in that famous essay, which is that he focuses on ideology as a mechanism of control. And for the party, it's actually a guide to action. It's a way of understanding the world and make scientific assessments about the world and to use those to drive their strategies in particular domains. And one of the problems in China studies in the last many decades is we've tended to have a problems-based research agenda. We look at what are China's problems and how is it failing to cope with them, essentially. And we use our own frameworks. But the thing is, in every particular domain of modernization, the party has a theory. They make assessments about that domain, whether it's culture or the military, the economy. And they, they build their long-term strategies in line with those theories. We need to unpack those theories. We need an ends-based research agenda uh, for China studies. And just a final comment on this um, notion of defensiveness. There's always this myth uh, that's out there in the China watching community that China's paramount aim is to retain, the party's paramount aim is to retain power. Um, I think that's condescending and, it, under, and, and it, um, it underrates the role of nationalism and it underrates the, the party leadership's confidence in their su successes um, to date. They've talked about their long-term aim as, as being a modern, powerful socialist country. Read the documents. That's what the documents say. And the record shows that they pursued that quite effectively. I mean, uh, staying in power, every, every political leadership wants to stay in power. Every person wants to survive. But if, I'm, if I see an immediate threat to my survival, I'm going to work on that. But that doesn't mean it's my long-term aim for my career or for my um, life story as a person. Um, and so I think we need to torpedo that, that myth. It just doesn't describe the nature of the competition we've been in with China. I'll stop there for now. Toshi, any, any uh, comments? 
Yeah, I mean, if I could just echo this, you know, this idea about offense, defense, is that we should see this in sequential terms over time. So that even if, at, even if we accept that China is strategically defensive today, what China accomplishes a decade from now may open opportunities for China to fulfill greater ambitions because it can. Uh, so I think we should keep an open mind. We, we, we shouldn't take a snapshot of what China is doing or what we think China is doing today as the basis for extrapolating what China will do a decade from now. So again, I think, uh, again, even if we accept that China is strategically defensive, I think it's important to note that China is using offensive means. And by employing those offensive means, it could create new strategic opportunities in the future. So I just, um, if I can, um just respond to uh, uh, two of the comments here. I think uh, there, are, there are areas where we, where we absolutely agree. There's, there's a couple areas where um, I, just an itch I'd like to scratch. Um, uh, on Toshi's point about a snapshot, I mean, I think, um, I think that's absolutely right. Um, I think the, the question is getting the aperture right, uh, which is to say, you know, are we, you know, what are we including in this snapshot in terms, uh, you know, in terms of what we're getting right, what we're getting wrong, and how to kind of extrapolate forward, which I always know is a, is a fool's errand oftentimes when it comes to China. Um, but this gets to the point that, uh, that Dan made about, um, you know, I couldn't agree with you more um, that we should be ends-based in uh, um, uh, kind of the political science approach uh, to, to China. But for me, the logical end is, doesn't end necessarily in kind of what, um, you know, what is uh, in a particular document or set of documents, but beyond that in terms of how it is animated, uh, and not simply among the people who are, who have access to it or who are charged with it or, or who care to read it, but how that is, uh, how that plays out and how it is absorbed or not, kind of more, more broadly and more generally. And for that, of course, the snapshot is not, uh, as, as you both, I think, rightly say, kind of not the way in which to, uh, to get at that question. Jessica? Great, and, and let me first um, applaud Jude for putting together such a nuanced panel. Even though we have differing views, I think this is, I would say, probably the, the best face of these differing opinions. And it's really wonderful that we can have this um, coolly rational <laughs> a discussion on such a heated topic. So I really wanted to um, thank you for that. Um, that said, I, don't, I clearly don't agree, uh, although I do think there is a lot of interesting overlap here, and I like uh, Toshi's idea of using offensive measures to achieve fundamentally defensive ends, and I think it's important to recognize that the strategies that one uses to counter um, efforts that are fundamentally defensively motivated look different than ones that are also, that are in turn driven by offensive um, motivations, and then in particular, um, there are a lot, that's why I invoked the idea of a security dilemma because uh, a competition that is motivated by a security dilemma can be uh, resolved, for example, by uh, pointing toward efforts by both sides in some kind of negotiated detente uh, or a formal agreement to walk back those offensive efforts. Uh, and it might require conceding a little bit on both sides, um, but nonetheless that points to the existence of some possibility of coexistence, rather than a uh, you know existential battle to the end, where I win only if you are fully defeated and um, in disarray, and so that's why I I don't think that the idea that um, the CCP is first and foremost trying to survive is a myth is a productive line of inquiry. I think that it's possible that there are and if likely there are concentric circles uh, in which you know the regime survival is. Number one, um, and I think that uh, you know, after that, you know, in 50 years, if you know that goal is no longer, if, if China is no longer confronting severe risks, which you know the party leadership is constantly pointing to, at that point, maybe they their uh, objectives will shift. But I think one of the problems with sort of reasoning from you know the 1920s or 30s Leninism and saying, you know, this is like this coherent ideology that has extended from then till now and will continue 30 years in the future, really neglects the vast uh, shifts in ideology within China um, 
over time, what not even just between Mao and today, but also within uh, the reform era, the incorporation of capitalists into the party, um, and all the many more nuances, I think, that Andy pointed out between ideology as a driver as opposed to an instrument. And so one of the problems, and I know that you're aware of this, but that when we look at party documents, there's a lot of rhetoric for domestic consumption, and how much is that truly what is motivating uh, the party leadership as opposed to the way they are wrapping um, sort of sort of naked authoritarianism and trying to legitimate that for their own uh, domestic audience. So I see a lot more pragmatism and uh, incoherence, um, I think, uh, following uh, Andy. But uh, when we think about how that is externalized around the globe, I do think it's really important to look at Chinese behavior. We can't just uh, assume uh, Chinese attentions and not look at what they have done to date. Of course, recognizing that over time things may change, but things change depending also on what we do. And this is why I thought that um, Andy's remarks um, were really uh, on the nose in, in talking about um, how what the United States is doing in the world will affect very much how China is able to compete. And if we put all of our eggs in this ideological basket, we are actually not competing in the ways that China is effective. Um, that isn't to say we shouldn't invest in trying harder um, for our own sake, um, and, but also to the extent that there are other countries around the world looking to models for how they should develop. Uh, we don't need to give uh, you know, the, the China any more uh, ammunition um, in, in peeling off others. So I guess that's what I would, uh, how I would respond initially, but again, a lot of, I think, a really productive fruit for thought here. Great, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, it's been civil up to this point, so hopefully um, <laughs> we'll keep that tone. Uh, so Q&A, uh, obviously, ground rules is, while we're very interested in what everyone personally thinks here about the topic, uh, if you can keep your, your question uh, brief, succinct, um, and uh, we'll, we'll go, uh, sir, right here is in the front. I think, wait, I think we'll have mics coming up. So any, anyone with a mic? This gentleman right here. Thank you. I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst and a former diplomat. When you add up all the human rights abuse cases around the world, it doesn't even come close to China. And so I have to ask, has this government lost the legitimacy to rule over a quarter of mankind? I mean, isn't it sort of time to start the campaign to break the Communist Party? by opening up the information systems, for example, so that uh, we can pay a little bit now rather than unbelievable amounts later. Great, thank you. Well, I, I think we know where you come down on the uh, are we in an ideological competition <laughs> uh, question. Uh, anyone want to make the case for regime change uh, on the panel here? <laughs> so, well, go ahead. Jessica? I just want to suggest that that kind of strategy, an offensive U.S. strategy to take down the Chinese Communist regime is precisely the type of strategy that the Chinese Communist Party is so determined to ward itself against. And so I think that this, if we're thinking about a security dilemma, we, both sides, I think, need to walk back the offensive efforts um, or think about how to negotiate that, um, lest we really unleash uh, a kind of global uh, cataclysm that we might be headed toward if that's can, can I ask though how do you think of that issue that rightfully raised on on where do US interests um, how sh uh, where do you interest interest uh, abut into overlap with human rights concerns that we now have on, on, on China and where does that fit into your thinking about an ideological competition if we have widespread abuses in let's say Xinjiang yeah. so I don't see this as primarily about ideology again this is about uh, authoritarian regime trying to uh, maintain power over a set of, I and mean, we're not thinking, you're particularly thinking about Xinjiang or perhaps just uh, within uh, the most majority Han parts of China. Uh, regardless, uh, you know, the Chinese Communist Party essentially inherited uh, an empire uh, that they don't want to admit. They would like to construe this as a coherent uh, nation. And, and I think that the Chinese uh, Communist Party leadership under Xi Jinping has uh, has gone in a disastrous direction of trying to um, force assimilation 
that said, I don't think that there is realistically a lot that uh, the United States to do, should or can do to topple the Chinese Communist Party. Um, I think what we can do is to say that this, what's going on is horrifying um, and to work with other countries around the globe uh, to point out quite clearly that this is harming China's image. And if China wants to be seen as a responsible uh, global leader that can tolerate uh, diverse views, which are in abundance around the globe, they need to start at home. Anyone else want to weigh in, Andy? I just uh, want, want to say a couple things. Um, I, I, you know, there, there's this truism that you know, the only thing that is more threatening to the United States than a strong China is a weak, unstable, um, and, um, and wounded, vulnerable China. Um, I think that, um, and I'm, I'm going to turn the question around because I, I don't, uh, I'm not going to gainsay, you know, China's uh, 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 terrible record on, on, on human rights, but that is something that, you know, China's giving, you know, has, there's, there's ample evidence that, that this is going on. Um, this is not something that has been pursued much on our end uh, recently. Um, uh, when I liken back to um, the discourse between the U.S. and China in the 1990s, uh, it was much more of an issue um, and, has, uh, and uh, is, is much less of one now. It's making a slight comeback, um, but it is not something that is really kind of undergirding our own engagement with China in a kind of ideological normative way. I mean, it seems to be, um, uh, and it seems to be uh, targeting China as a way to weaken China, not necessarily, in my view, as a way to actually um, uh, help the people who are the victims of it. And I'm particularly thinking about uh, what's the, the, um, uh, the various things that are being done right now uh, over Hong Kong. So I, I think that that should be part of the conversation. Um, it really hasn't been, um, and not for kind of China's lack of trying. Great. Next question. Uh, I think. Can I? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Please, Toshi. Yeah. So, I, you know, I think <laughs> maybe it's worth sort of asking. So, why, why is uh, you know to talk about sort of the nature of the regime is you know why why is China trying to make the world safe for authoritarianism for its kind of authoritarianism? Because there are actors out there, including the West, uh, that they sense does not fully accept the legitimacy uh, of an authoritarian regime, right? Um, and so we, so we have to kind of ask ourselves, you know, uh, are, uh, are, are we truly really ready to accept um, the very nature of the regime that we're dealing with? Now for some time, I think, we were able to uh, put that argument aside and say, you know, we have you know, an engagement strategy that will eventually, you know, lead to liberalization, you know, the soothing argument that that will you know, that, that outcome will occur. But the premise of that argument is that we are fundamentally, or at least the premise of that strategy, is that we are fundamentally uh, uncomfortable with, uh, at a minimum, uncomfortable with the, with the very nature of the regime. So, I, you know, I think we have to come to terms with that. Uh, and, you know, I think that's, that's at the root of this fundamental um, fear on the part of the Chinese Communist Party, because it, it sees, it sees that the West has not fully come to terms with and accepted the very nature of the regime. I'd like to, to offer some thoughts on this as well. So I disagree with the premise that if we draw attention to this issue, it intensifies strategic distrust on Beijing's, from Beijing's perspective. Because I think that that perception that they are in a defensive ideological war with us and we want to change the nature of their system has been a core tenet of the party's worldview since Mao. And it, it's beyond the, the, the uh, um, United Front Work Department. It, you look, read leadership speeches and their selective works, they all articulate it. So I don't see that we can actually address that by not doing it. We're getting credit from the regime for holding that view, except for we're not doing a lot about it. And to provide a little more nuance uh, to my um, discussion of of ideology and respond. Um, I'm not saying that, that we should put all of our eggs in the, um, in the basket of ideology, but I do think that it is a genuine area where despite all of our criticism about our own system and the turmoil that our own system is in at present, uh, 
I think there's still a night and day comparison that is apparent to the world, and Beijing perceives it as, as an area of vulnerability. So no US president on the 4th of July is going to say, please believe in the Constitution, whereas at the five-year anniversary of the party's birth, the general secretary always gives a speech, and he says, have faith in socialism. We have to believe socialism is the right path for China. So there is a vulnerability. But what the 19th Party Congress represents is an assessment by the party that they have to begin to actually make the case for their system. And they have to make that case in part because being the number two power in the world, their system's ability to deliver on things like governance and the environment and justice are now exposed to the light of comparison whether they want to or not. And they say, this, we have always been aimed at proving our system superior we have to now begin to do so. It's not doing so tomorrow. They would admit they have many problems, but the aim is to, is, is to do so. And it strives, it stems directly from their nationalist um, project. Thanks, Dan. Andy, you had a two finger. Just a very, very quick, uh, just, just to, um, again, respond to the initial question. I, I think one of the things that, um, that we often forget is that there was a period of time between around 2002, 2003, up until about 2008, maybe just a little bit before that, that um, China had, in, 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 in a number of really significant and meaningful ways, opened up and liberalized so that it really resembled something very, very different than the China that we see today. And I think it might be a worthful intellectual and maybe policy exercise to try to get a sense of what, if anything, that we did in the lead into that might have fostered that that kind of small kind of period of time. Because uh, if in fact that is something that if what, what China was doing was a kind of a medium term response to some sort of US pressure or global pressure, then that is something to, to, to consider. Um, but I think when, when, we, when we fail to look at kind of the, 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 uh, uh, the peaks and valleys of China's human rights record um, then, you know, and just look at it kind of monolithically, it doesn't really give us the purchase that we would need to, to have to be able to do something about it. Great, thanks. John, I think you, you've had your hand up early. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, John Fay with the Mansfield Foundation. Um, so my question is regards to the uh, US, possible US policy responses. Whether the ideology is, um, a guiding force or the core of what's going on uh, in the Chinese system? Uh, does it really matter in the end when China you know, is a major shareholder in the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank and is a major player in terms of climate change vis-a-vis uh, -vis how the United States should work uh, with China to solve problems? Great. Thanks, John. I'm always ready to jump in. Right. Dan, go you, ahead. Dan, you start oh, us off. Oh, okay. Um, well, one thing that I that I like to say, and I'll be interested in the the audiences and the fellow panelists' view of this, is I think it's important to to characterize the nature of the contest accurately. I don't I don't I don't like the term competition because to me competition sounds like a tennis match that we're playing the same game, and I think Beijing is playing a very different game. It's not uh, playing by our rules it does in some some areas, but I like the term rivalry. I don't I don't think it's an existential um, contest, but I like the term rivalry because I think rivalry captures the notion that there are high stakes that really matter, and there's a great deal of distrust, and that does not mean that we can't cooperate. You can cooperate with a rival with a rival in love or in economics. You know someone's you see a car accident, and you both get out of your cars to help the person. There's a flood, you both help someone. There's lots of areas we need to cooperate with China, but there's a, there are legitimate reasons for the lack of trust, and we do have incompatible goals on a broad scale. And so I think rivalry captures that. I, I, by no means me, does it mean having no relationship with China, but that's what I would offer uh, to, on that score. Great. Yeah, I mean, the way that I would characterize it uh, is, is to think about this as a long-term peacetime competition or rivalry. I don't really care, for, I, you know, either <laughs> term. It works for me. Um, but what that means, I think, is 
is, is, is to acknowledge, first of all, that this is something that's likely to evolve or take place and change and shift uh, over time. Not, not in the next two, three years, but perhaps over the next five, five years, over the next decade. We're talking about really reshaping the terms of the competition when we get into the 2030s. And that means that if it requires us to use sort of all implements of national power to include the ideological ones, to shift the terms of the competition in ways that we think favor us, uh, then I think we need to employ uh, all of those uh, tools, all of those instruments, all of those levers um, in order to, 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 again, shift the terms of the competition. So I'm not looking for a quote unquote a win because there isn't a win in a long-term peacetime competition. It's a constant iterative uh, competition. It's, a, it's, it's an interaction between two living forces yeah. over the long term. I think that's probably a, a better way of thinking about how ideology could potentially fit into that kind of a relationship. Great, good comments. Yeah, Andy? So, so I, have a, I have a slightly different um, take and, and, and a more prosaic one. Um, so I, just like to a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, for me, any question about China um, is a bureaucratic question. Um, and I think in terms of policy responses, one of the things that where, where bureaucracy actually um, works towards positive ends is the degree to which things are uh, so compartmentalized in China um, in terms of kind of various uh, policy groupings. Now that's, that's, you know, those are, you know, over time those, those shifts they, they shift in terms of uh, degree, but not in kind. But the other thing that we're, we're also ignoring in, in, in this conversation is there's this huge technocratic class within uh, the Chinese government. Um, and they're the ones who are really on the front lines of a lot of, um, uh, 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 of the policy fronts. So um, I'm not necessarily sure we're capturing that, demogra that um, political or policy demographic in this conversation here. And I think what that would, the effect that that would have is really kind of to put the stops on some of the more kind of charged um, uh, energy on, on, on both sides. So what I'd, um, I think that question is really helpful because it gets at the limits of the ideological frame for looking at China's motivations. How China behaves towards the IMF, how it behaves in climate change negotiations has almost nothing to do um, with what some of the folks here on the stage think um, China is all about. And in particular, if you care about those issues, I think it's important to look not at ideology, but what I see as the domestic politics shaping China's international um, actions and ambitions. And those are nationalism, um, a focus on delivering economic growth, and third, a focus on maintaining public security at home, including uh, the CCP's survival vis-a-vis -vis, uh, unrest and threats from within society. And so, uh, you know, an issue like the IMF, this is, you know, a piece of the U.S.-led international order that doesn't really touch on, uh, you know, except for the, the question of, of growth and macroeconomic stability, it's not one in which China has much interest in, other than gaining more say within that institution, it doesn't have an interest in fundamentally uh, reshaping or especially not rejecting uh, the sort of existing international norms. And on climate change, um, actually China's domestic interest in preventing uh, unrest over the issues of air pollution and other uh, types of uh, environmentally motivated uh, unrest against the, the Chinese uh, system have actually had positive international spillover effects. And so you, thinking about um, domestic politics in China in a more nuanced way rather than taking, uh, seeing everything as rooted in Leninism, I think is also um, quite important for, ex for understanding the variation in China, how China has engaged with um, the international system, where in some cases um, it is, you know, being, it's proactive in uh, assisting uh, with international efforts to address common problems, and in other cases where those uh, international norms particularly, say, on human rights, um, conflict with, uh, you know, CCP rule at home, that's where you get the kind of rejection or attempts to reshape. Um, and so uh, I appreciate this question because it sheds light on some of the other things that we aren't talking about here and, and, and points out some of the limits of using this ideology frame. Great. Um, Peter. Peter Mattis at the Congressional Executive Commission on China. Just a Quick question, so we're really talking about the U.S. and China on a global stage. Uh, 
Could you, and the question about the IMF kind of brings it to the fore. So you have, what are China, or the Chinese Communist Party's ambitions for global governance? You know, what does the international system look like? And if perhaps if, if ideology is part of the driver, could, you ex could one of you explain the relationship between that view of global governance and the domestic political system in China, given the obvious cognates between the sort of the liberal institutions in the international system and U.S. domestic politics. Great, thanks. Let's take first whack. Small question. Uh, if I mean, if I could just, uh, you know, if if the assumption is that there's a correlation between what happens internally in terms of the internal governance of a state and how it views international institutions, um, I think that there is a case to be made. For example, China's interpretation of international law in the maritime domain could be seen as a reflection of how it governs itself internally, right? Uh, China's interpretation of the exclusive economic zone that it claims is an inherently closed one. It's one that um, confers much greater jurisdiction to the coastal states than the vast majority of the seafaring nations accept, right? Which is that China can control certain activities uh, within those waters claimed uh, by China and that external players operating in the exclusive economic zone needs to uh, get permission from, from China. So now one could say that that's because China has a continental mindset, that might be one interpretation, but another interpretation might be that it's not necessarily inconsistent with the closed nature of the regime itself and that, that, that there is a sort of um, a correlation between again how how the Chinese system itself functions and how it then translates that into the operationalization of some of these international institutions. Just a guess. Dan? So it's a, it's a great question and it gets to an area where we need a lot more research because if you look at the literature on China's foreign policy or China's view of international relations, there's a lot of literature on actions, but there's not a lot of literature that takes the ideas seriously. And where there is a literature that takes the ideas seriously, it's looking at what Chinese academics are writing, but there isn't a sense of the transmission belt between what they're writing and what becomes the party's official theory. And in Leninist states, the, the party's official theory of international affairs is not designed just to assess what's happening internationally, it's also designed to change uh, the, the world. And um, when you look at community with a shared future for, uh, for mankind or community with a common destiny, which was the original translation, didn't sound quite as, as good, so they changed it. Um, there's a way in which it does seem to resemble China's domestic... Um, Dan, can you just explain yeah. just very briefly what that is? Sure. Community with the shared future for mankind is a, a foreign policy concept that um, Xi Jinping laid out at the United Nations almost 10 years to the day after Hu Jintao had laid out his vision of harmonious world. So if you see a Chinese leader addressing the United Nations on a, on a 10 year anniversary, they might be laying out a foreign policy concept. And what's interesting about it is it's very different from what we've traditionally thought about China's foreign policy vision. We've, you know, harmonious world is kind of this notion that we're not gonna converge with the West, but um, but we're invoking a, a traditional Confucian concept of harmony while reserving differences. So you sort of picture dancers dancing together, but they never touch. So they can cooperate on a few things, but community of the shared future is based on an assessment that the world is an increasingly integrated one, where China's development and the world's are, are tightly linked, and what happens in the world affects China, and, and also what China does affects the world. And that should lead us to wonder about the parallel between China's domestic political model, which under Xi it's begun to push as, a mo as something that others can learn from, of the party making the right decisions on behalf of, of uh, the nation, but consulting with these other uh, political parties that they allow to exist, sort of nominal political parties and other groups in society. There's a way in which community of the shared future looks like it may well be that same model of politics, of China setting the standards for things. Other countries are hitching themselves to China's standards. And China's success and China's morality is radiating outwards from Beijing. That's certainly what some Chinese academics have 
articulated as, as a vision. And Xi Jinping actually quotes from the Book of Rights to invoke that in his speeches. Um, but we don't yet have a scholarly work that really unpacks that transmission belt. So this is kind of preliminary research, but I think it maps on to what we're seeing. Thanks, Andy. So um, I, it's a great question. I, I um, will, won't, certainly won't be doing any, any justice to it. Um, I mean, there's, a, there's, a, there's an unsatisfying response and there's a slightly less unsatisfying <laughs> response. And the, the unsatisfying response is it depends. Uh, the slightly less unsatisfying response is it really depends on the policy area. Um, and I, I think one of the things that we, you know, if, if we look back um, over the past 20, 30 years, and look at how China has uh, participated in various kind of global governance institutions or regimes. When you look at uh, the, the realm of economics, for example, um, particularly during the various crises, um, whether it is the East Asian financial crisis or the, or, or, or the global financial crisis, it has tended to act quite responsibly. Um, when you look at issues like climate change, this is something that China, China's leaders and a lot of its citizens see as, a, as an existential crisis. With others, other policy areas, it might be, um, uh, it, it becomes uh, less, less clear. And I guess the larger question that that raises is, you know, we're talking a lot about China's aspirations, but uh, one of the interesting things about studying Chinese domestic politics is looking at how these policies actually work out in the implementation and the enforcement. And one of the kind of the big hypotheses that I throw at all my doctoral students and uh, raise in forums like this is to what degree are we likely to see um, the same kind of, whether you want to call it fragmentation or um, kind of ends uh, or, or, or rather kind of enforcement not really matching up to the actual spirit and letter of the policy form, policies formulated in Beijing, to what degree, which is, just a matter of, 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 of truth to understanding Chinese domestic politics, to what degree does that model um, explain what China's likely international performance is, is going to be? Because if that's the case, um, then uh, we have a much more, uh, uh, Jessica's term was pragmatic, but was it pragmatic and incoherent? Was that the... <laughs> I mean, which, which would uh, you know, very much uh, uh, be along those lines, which, which paints a very, very different picture and, 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 and stipulates kind of very different potential policy responses on our end than um, the, the, the scenario in which kind of what Beijing proposes, it disposes. Jessica? I think another way, I mean, this, is another, this sort of follows in that last question, which is I think another uh, you know, value of looking at Chinese uh, objectives vis-a-vis -vis the international system, um, and to see China as really sort of focused instrumentally on advancing its objectives in service of, sort of nationalism, growth, and um, domestic security, uh, is to look at um, you know the contrast between uh, how China uh, approaches different so different sovereignty in the international system in different ways. Like on some. Um, you know, like in discussions of cyber governance, being you know very very focused on advocating so-called cyber sovereignty, making sure that uh, countries like China um, can prevent information flows, and um, you don't want international governance to impede on uh, that sort of sovereign prerogative. But on other issues, where, um, for example, on humanitarian intervention and the responsibility to protect, uh, China has been willing to compromise on the principle of sovereignty um, because it's it's largely about you know, countries pretty far from um, China's borders. It doesn't directly affect whether the CCP, CCP uh, remains in power, and, and China has helped participate in shaping that norm um, uh, over time. Um, similarly, when we go to the issue of, of maritime law, which uh, Toshi brought up, you know, it's in China's maritime periphery where China's interpretation of the, uh, the law of the sea is in contradiction with sort of the majority interpretation. But the farther you go from China's borders, freedom of navigation globally, China's happy to say, let's park a, you know, a ship off of uh, Hawaii. And so there is this apparent uh, contradiction, which I think really, um, again, reflects not a coherent ideological as, you know, um, attack on the U.S.-led order, but rather a very pragmatic uh, set of focus on what is in China's national interest. Um, 
irrespective of its uh, Leninist system at home. And so you have, on the one hand, you know, China defending. Uh, I think if that were the case, if that were really what was driving China globally, you wouldn't see them defending globalization. You would, I mean, you wouldn't see even the attempt rhetorically to defend aspects of the international order. You would have a very different um, foreign policy rhetoric uh, as well as a different strategy. Great, we're gonna do, uh, yes sir, uh, short question. We've got three minutes, so we'll have 30 second answers uh, uh, at a maximum. Uh, <clears throat> Gil Rosman, the Asan Forum. Uh, my question is directed to uh, Dan and maybe Toshi, and it relates to the timing of China's thinking about ideological importance. Um, is this deeply set in kind of a, a Leninist history? Is this a decision in the late 80s or after 89? Is it uh, 2008, as was suggested? Is it Xi Jinping? To what extent can we differentiate the degree to which ideological is issues have been at the center of China's thinking? So, 30 seconds, Dan. Yeah, so I, <laughs> I would... I would say that I think that the only area Xi Jinping is really dis, um, not in line with his predecessors is the cult of personality that Deng and Zhang would not have, have advanced. But I think that in terms of the party's goals and its vision for the future, I think there's enormous continuity when you look at the speeches and, and, and the documents. And relatedly to, to Jessica's point about shifts in ideology, uh, sure, I agree that there have been m many changes and, and shifts twists and turns, as the party might say, but I would argue that when you look at the documents, there's a hard core of consistency, and that hard core of consistency is significant for our strategic competition with China. To, um, to Andrew's point um, about um, for, for how they're actually executing the policy and difficulties with that, I agree that's a, a key analytic issue. What I'm trying to call attention to in my research is that we haven't gotten the first point Right, I think that's the second point, which is to say, okay, they say they have these intentions, how are they doing? I agree with, you know, I think it's important, Jessica and, and Andrew both called attention to ways in which their fulfillment may not be perfect, but I think it's key to the strategic competition to understand what their intentions are, and I don't think we've done so. I include myself in that. For many, many years, I would have briefed the opposite view. Okay, just quickly, uh, Toshi and then Andy, I think you wanted to get something in there. No, Toshi, Andy? So just uh, in response to the question, though it wasn't directed at me, I think one really useful place to look for part of the answer to that question is in Jude's book. So oh, that's not what to, a great uh, okay. just, uh, Thank you. This is one long actual <laughs> infomercial. Um, right. Well, great. Well, um, uh, awkwardly, I'll end it right there. Um, uh, <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming out. I think this is obviously the, the first of many discussions we'll have on this, this issue. Um, I think there's some coffee and whatnot out there, and if you strain hard enough, you can actually look into Andy's office right through that building, so uh, uh, please take the opportunity.